There's lies, there's danged lies, and there's storage benchmarks. PCIe Gen 5 on the desktop. Is it finally the year of the Gen 5 on the desktop? I know we've taken a look at the crucial T700 Gen 5, and yeah, it's got the numbers, it's pretty fast, but what about Fison? What about their offering? What about the maximum with the 14? <sighs> All right, let's take a look. All right, first off, do you even have the capability to run Gen 5 on your desktop? You've gotta be running like AMD, AM5, or Z790, but things are weird on Z790. Intel opted to put the 16 GPU lanes as the lanes that do Gen 5. So if you wanna use Gen 5 storage, you gotta break it out. I mean, Asus has got solutions like this. This actually solves two problems at the same time. One, you can stick this in your other X8 slot, which is also Gen 5, on, only on certain motherboards. And then you get your eight lanes whittled down to just four PCIe Gen 5 M.2. It might've been nice if this was a dual M.2, but that would've made it also wildly more expensive on an already wildly expensive motherboard. And also this thing is all heat sink. Like this, this is metal. I could recycle this and get like $8. It's so much metal. This isn't really a problem on AM5. That's what I've got in our test system here. This is a 16 core 7950X outfitted with the maximum. The other thing is a lot of people are uh, worried about the tiny little fan on the heatsink. The good news is you don't need the tiny little fan on the heatsink unless you're just in the worst possible scenario. Pretty much every Gen 5 motherboard has reasonable cooling. And so you won't use the tiny little fan. But if you are thermal throttling, it will hold your performance back and then you'll need the tiny little fan. For benchmarking, I like to use PC Mark. PC Mark, the benchmark, you gotta understand how it works. It is basically playing back the same kinds of thing in a software application stack over and over and over again every time you run the benchmark. It's very repeatable, even though it's really automating like Teams and Microsoft Office, well, it's a video conferencing program and an Office suite application and a multimedia creation suite and that kind of thing. It's, I'm oversimplifying a little bit here, but it's a binary trace. Basically, it watched somebody actually using stuff and saved literally every instruction they did and then it plays it back, including writes to the disk and everything else. So PC Mark gives you a pretty reasonable approximation of what it's gonna be like to use this drive in a desktop class scenario. A lot of the time on this channel, when I'm really excited about drives, it's drives that look like this. This is an old, old, old Optane. This is a DC P4800X. This is only 375 gigs. These were wildly expensive back in the day. This drive is not faster than the maximum from Fison when we're talking about transfer speed. It's not even close. This thing can barely do two gigabytes per second. That thing's rocking 14 gigabytes per second. Why am I so excited by this kind of a drive? It's the latency. This is on the order of 284 microseconds of latency through the Windows driver stack and Crystal Disk Mark. This thing is more like 70 through the Windows driver stack. The actual drive latency is even less than that. You lose a lot to software. When you tune this in a server application, you get even better latencies. The other thing is sustained performance. When we're talking about enterprise drives and uh, you know a common workload, I've got all the memory cards for all the video stuff that I'm doing. I'm gonna copy 256 or 512 gigabytes at a time. These Gen 5 client drives are not super good at that use case. They have what's called an SLC cache or a write cache or something like that. And that is a, a buffer that the software on the drive creates internally. It's completely invisible to the operating system to make it so that when you're doing this kind of operation that it goes really quickly. And then once it's copied, it'll copy it around again in order to free the buffer for the next time that you do that. Reading from these is also a little tricky. The reason that reading from these is so tricky, the reason that Gen 5 hasn't really been a thing is that the folks that make flash media haven't really been super interested in making faster flash media. You see, the flash media that they're making, the profit margins haven't been all that great the last couple of years with the global situation and everything else, and now we're starting to climb out of that hole. Uh, they're sort of controlling the supply, and because they're controlling the supply, and because of a whole bunch of other factors, there's not really a lot of impetus on creating faster flash media. But we need media that is designed to go faster. The flash media actually has a clock speed, yeah, the flash media is actually designed to operate at a certain clock speed. There is 
mechanical transistor machinery in there beyond technically the transistors that are used to store the state. That's a whole is like, is that a transistor? Is that not a transistor? Yeah, kind of with a gate and a sink and, you know, depending on how you want to think about it. But there's not really an impetus to produce media. So binning enters the picture. It's like we're going to bend the media. And so it's been difficult to uh, bend enough media that is reliably fast at higher than designed for clock speeds in order to be able to do this. The other way that you can make up the difference with speed is to have more channels to make the device wider so that you have more chips or more pools, banks, ever how you want to classify it, uh, operating in parallel. That works. That's a great strategy. Enterprise drives do that. Like big drives like this where you got a lot of, a lot of room to move. It's a little harder to do that on something like an M.2. You have to do it with stacks inside of physical chips or 3D packaging or something like that. And again, the margins aren't there to do that in consumer. I mean, yeah, when you're talking about thousands of dollars for a 375 gigabyte drive, you can get creative. But for a client drive, not so much. So the fact that these drives are as fast as they are, engineers have already moved mountains to just profit pennies per drive, which is kind of mind blowing. And so when I look at these numbers, 14 gigabytes per second read, 12 gigabytes per second write, that is insanely genuinely impressive. The downside is that it can't sustain these speeds when it's running truly enterprise or workstation workloads. When you fully load it and you do a bunch of other stuff, the reads are going to slow down a little bit. The writes are going to slow down a little bit. When the media has, you know, 30, 40% wear on it, it's going to slow down a little bit because it's harder to read the cells. It's harder to read the flash cells. It's harder to write to the flash cells. So things will slow down a little bit. For a client drive, if you want games to run really fast and have reasonable latencies, Fison's got a winner on its hands. And the heat production and the power usage, the power usage is pretty good, you know, less than 15 watts. Drives like this can be 25 watts, so they're doing better than this. And 85% of the time, it doesn't need the little fan. But when it does need the little fan, you really do need the little fan. I mean, we're posting 1.7 million IOPS here just from Crystal Diskmark. Crystal Diskmark is, is in itself a flawed benchmark. But the fact that it can achieve 1.7 million IOPS, it is truly breathtakingly impressive. It really is. Also, the mixed workload is pretty revealing on this because some drives are optimized just for read and then you start throwing writes at them and the performance goes out the window. The mixed performance here where you can manage 6 gigabytes per second read and 12 gigabytes per second write, that's pretty good. Flesson is doing a lot more impressive work than they were doing when Gen 4 drives first launched. The first generation Gen 4 drives were a little shaky. And with Gen 5, pretty much every company was reluctant to get a product out the door because of the media problems and because of the volume problem and because of the lack of massive profit margins and because it just doesn't make gaming all that much faster. Why doesn't it make gaming faster when you have 14 gigabyte per second read? Well, that's definitely gonna help you on your level load speed, but what actually makes the computer feel snappier is latency. It's that random 4K microseconds, 284. From 284 to 100 is something that you can feel a difference on using the machine. If you have a lot of memory, you can offset that. So if the system is not constrained for RAM and you do the same thing a couple of different times, it'll get cached in memory. And then effectively, that random 4K number is very, very low, very much lower than that because your memory is almost an order of magnitude faster when we're talking about latency. And so if you have some data on here that has been read and cached into system memory, memory that you're not using for programs, then uh, it will feel insanely way fast, which is great. That's the whole design of the thing. In fact, modern versions of Windows, I don't know if you've noticed, there's this compressed in parentheses. So even if you have 48 gigabytes of memory, which is you know kind of a lot in 2024, not a ton, 64 gigabytes would be better, 128 gigs would just be incredible. The system will use all the memory that it's not using for read cache from the drives, but it also compresses it. So you effectively have a lot more memory than you really realize. And that's because CPUs are so much faster than everything else now, and they have so much stuff in them to accelerate compression type operations, AVX 512 and other SIMD type instructions. You, you don't notice that the compression and decompression takes a few extra microseconds. The effect of having that much more stuff in memory makes the computer feel insanely way faster, even though the latency is maybe slightly, slightly worse as a result of using the compression. And this is also true for 
storage devices. Like it'll just compress everything. So if you've got a large cache of stuff that you've read from the block device, that's gonna get compressed. And it's still gonna make the system feel faster because decompressing that from RAM is still faster than reading it from here, unless this is absurdly fast. And this is absurdly fast, but the latency is what gets you. Overall from Fison, this is a very impressive offering. I worry a little bit about the, the overclock, the faster than normal, a uh, NAND flash, what that might do for longevity and what that might do for performance over the long haul. This drive doesn't have any dramatically better or worse wear endurance, at least according to the rating and specifications. <laughs> Time will tell if anybody shows up at the level one forums a year or two from now just to say, hey, my drive is not working or something has worn out prematurely. It is four level cells. We haven't moved on to five level cells or anything like that, where you're going to have to get really creative with what's on the drive. And I am very impressed that this is the first drive that I've tested that really does not run well when it is naked. You cannot run this drive naked reasonably. This is not a reasonable laptop upgrade or anything like that. It does require cooling, whether that is the motherboard heatsink or worst case scenario, the tiny little fan. The motherboard heatsink will do it then you're good to go. I also tested this drive in our Falcon Northwest Talon workstation, which does not have a fan for the M.2, but it is up near the power connector. And there was more than sufficient airflow through the case to keep this drive cool in that scenario. The T700, however, does run a bit cooler. The T700 is a little picky about how you mount it in the upper slot, but it will not thermal throttle either. So both of those showing a pretty good result there, I think, in terms of thermals and throttling and that sort of thing. But uh, you really shouldn't be running these modern drives with no heat sink whatsoever. Like, the, the, the world has moved on. You really do need a heat sink on your M.2 at this point. I'm Woodless Level 1. This has been a quick look at the Fison Maximum drive and there are other drives from other makers that are based around this controller you can expect similar performance because it's going to use Fison's software stack it's just you're going to have some other company that you're going through for a warranty or some other company's got a special deal on on media or has been able to improve the situation or whatever same as we saw with gen 4 drives you know gigabyte had their drive and some other vendors had their version of the drive that's uh, probably going to happen here i'm with level one i'm signing out you can find me in the level one forums mm.